Hello, um, my name is Anthony O'Neill, and I will be doing a presentation on James Bond as a pop icon throughout the ages. Um, so the first critical period in Bond's development uh, was in the 1950s and early 1960s. Um, the Bond series uh, was started at a very um, important time throughout the, in the world history. Um, during the 1950s, the standard of living in the world, especially the Western world, um, had peaked. It was uh, a lot of new technology that reduced uh, the time it took to do labor-intensive chores, um, and so people ended up having a lot more leisure time. And um, what better way to spend your leisure time than reading spy fiction, uh, like Ian Fleming's Bond series. Um, and although the standard of living was so high at this time, um, there was still definitely a gap between Bond's extravagance and like your standard average Englishman. Um, and so seeing Bond's like luxury and way of living, uh, people were able to admire that, they respected that almost, almost as something that they wished they could be. Um, and in reading the books, they sort of um, almost escaped into a fantasy where they pretended that they could be living that sort of lifestyle. Um, and not only were they escaping into a fantasy to see what other lifestyle they could be living, there was also the tensions of the Cold War going on uh, between the East and the West immediately after World War II. Um, the Soviet Union and the United States of America uh, started a Cold War. Um, and uh, there was a lot of tension during those times, um, a lot of threats of nuclear war and stuff like that. And when people read these books, they were able to see their own sensationalized understandings of like intelligence agency work and stuff like that reflected in these novels and even if it was like a fictional book just the notion that was presented in these novels that um, everything was being taken care of behind the scenes in a way uh, was reinsuring for the consumers um, and James Bond <laughs> has been uh, presented as uh, just this macho manly man um, throughout all of his novels is a very standard of masculinity um, and that can be seen in his wealth um, the way he just spends so extravagantly um, as in Casino Royale um, when he is uh, gambling in the casino and he's throwing away millions and millions of Swiss francs um, and is able to get uh, more after he runs out to spend more and more millions of francs um, to take down the shift um, and also um, sex is a very predominant theme of course in most of Bond's novels uh, well Fleming's novels of Bond um, and uh, you see time and time again of uh, Bond um, falling for these very beautiful women um, who were very glamorized um, and travel of course uh, Bond gets to go all across the world for these missions and even though these missions are very uh, dangerous of course um, you still get to see like wow like that's crazy like he's in Turkey he's in Montenegro he's in France he's in Jamaica uh, which is again the luxury of his lifestyle and of course being a killer like he's a stone-cold ruthless killer and um, however grotesque that might be there is some sort of uh, I think envious quality there not of Bond but of people to Bond um, in that he is a very like alpha type of guy. Um, he's a very confident persona. Um, he is very like few emotions. Uh, like when Vesper Lind in Casino Royale, um, she ends up killing herself, um, Bond's lover, and she leaves him a note saying that she was a double agent and uh, she couldn't keep living this way. Uh, and when Bond calls his agency to tell them what happened, he's just like, that bitch is dead. So, like, I feel like that's very um, exemplary of Bond's, like, steely attitude. Uh, and, of course, uh, Bond did not occur in a vacuum. The novels were not written in a vacuum. Um, Fleming uh, had a lot of inspiration, a lot of books to go off of um, to produce the series, but primarily, uh, Dennis Sweetley's Gregory Celeste series was um, an inspiration in that uh, he wrote about Gregory Celeste, a spy. Um, he published the first book in 1934, about 20 years before Fleming uh, wrote his first book. Um, and it had a lot of similar themes like espionage and uh, Celeste being a womanizer, chasing after women and such. Um, and as you can see in Black August, Dennis Sweetley, the first book.
uh, Casino Royale. That was the first book written by Bond. He was uh, writing one day in his GoldenEye estate in Jamaica um, because he was very anxious and stressed, about, uh, stressed out about his upcoming nuptials. And um, this is sort of how he escaped. He escaped into his books, his writing, um, to live out like a fantasy life for himself. Um, and the book ended up being an instant success. Um, it took a while to get published. Fleming was not very sure of his writing at all, but it took off in Britain. It sold out very easily. Um, and in this period, we end up seeing uh, Fleming writes uh, over a dozen more books. He writes books like Dr. No, um, Moonraker, uh, From Russia with Love, all during this period. And uh, the first Bond films, um, Dr. No was published in 1962. Um, and that was the first film, uh, official like major production film, uh, that about James Bond. Uh, Sean Connery was the first actor, and he gave a face to Bond. Uh, this character that had only existed in novels um, finally had uh, a face to the name, uh, and he became much more real. Um, he became much more relatable uh, and less of like a figment of people's imagination. Uh, and then Connery, he ends up appearing again for Much With Love in 1963. Uh, and several of the other Bond films. Uh, he was the first, he was the original Bond. Uh, and in the movies, you see more technology and gadgets. Uh, like in Dr. No, you see like cyanide cigarettes and the radio being powered by um, Dr. No's nuclear reactor. Uh, and these are type of technologies that are almost like unrealistic for the average person to even think of at this time. Um, so again, it sort of established like this uh, again, this distance from Bond, from the average person, uh, which it contributed to making him such an icon. Um, and Bond uh, appear, appeared in multiple types of media. Uh, first and foremost, he appeared on the anthology television series, Climax. Um, so what that means, there was a single episode that featured the plot of Casino Royale, uh, which again helped spread Bond's image to people who watch Climax or uh, and such. Uh, and also he appeared in comic strips. John McGlusky uh, started creating a comic strip in the Daily Express, which featured the adventures of Bond throughout the many novels in 1958. Uh, and that helped spread uh, the idea of Bond to um, consumers who only read newspapers, which were extremely, extremely popular at, at this time, um, which was actually a very important thing that helped to spread Bond's image. Uh, and of course, Bond toys, like there was Bond board games, there was Bond cars, like it was insane how heavily inundated the market was with like Bond merchandise um, because he was such an icon, he was so idolized that uh, people, like the idea of like a Bond board game, that's crazy, you know? But yeah, And so that was the first period of Bond and the second period, the transitional Bond, um, occurred from the mid 60s to the early 70s. Um, and here we see some new influences, some new developments, in the characterization of Bond. Um, the books of this period included On Her Majesty's Secret Service and Live and Let Die, among others. Um, On Her Majesty's Secret Service, that included the appearance of Blofeld, a villain, um, who appeared several times throughout the Bond series. This was the second time. He's probably one of the most frequently recurring villains in the Bond franchise, which is especially odd, because usually uh, what happens in these novels is that the villain is like one and done. Um, the plot revolves around Bond taking out the villain, and then they're done. Um, which is weird for this because it's part of like a trilogy within the series about Bond trying to take down Blofeld. Um, and so just the uh, everlasting nature of the villain um, sort of changed the theme of the books. Uh, and then Live and Let Die, uh, Bond goes to America, uh, which shows his spreading appeal across the world. Um, he was spreading to America. And so, of course, Fleming wanted to, I imagine, expand his American consumer base. So what better way than to have the plot actually take place in America? Um, which, again, showed his spreading appeal and stuff. But also, in this book, you see um, the British Secret Service working with the CIA, but not so much working with the CIA as in the CIA, CIA is like helping out um, in a way that sort of implied that the US um, C CIA was inferior to the British Secret Service, um, although it might not have existed that way in that time, in reality, uh, the novel sort of presented it in that way. Um, 
which again gave inclination to the idea of Bond being such a superior uh, figure of the West, uh, even better than the American CIA. Uh, and of course, Bond in this period is still a woman's man. Um, he, uh, every single book continued to feature the archetypal Bond woman, thin, pale, curvaceous, large-breasted, um, as you can see on this cover of Tracy DiVincenzo, uh, which he actually ends up marrying in the book um, uh, in On Her Majesty's Secret Service, which was exceptionally weird for a Bond novel. Uh, Bond, this uh, everlasting bachelor, uh, to be tied down to marriage, um, definitely changed the perception and image of Bond. Uh, so no longer was he just this, like, uh, just bachelor on a rampage, he had deep, emotional feelings. He was very committed to Tracy de Vincenzo, um, and he definitely loved her, uh, which showed a new side to Bond, a new, more uh, emotionally uh, impactful, showing emotional depth to him. Uh, but at the end of the novel, of course, uh, Tracy de Vincenzo, she ends up dying, um, so the Brown franchise can continue, and he can, can continue his womanizing ways. But um, the idea there, I believe, was to show um, that Bond was not so one-dimensional. He had uh, complex feelings and emotions. Um, and in this period, we see Bond as someone who uh, works with other groups. Uh, like, again, in After Majesty's Secret Service, he works with Felix Spider uh, from the CIA, uh, and again, in a way that sort of implied the uh, superiority of the British Secret Service to the CIA, and he also works with uh, Mark Ann Straco, um, he was the head of a really large European crime syndicate, and he's also the father of Tracy DiVincenzo, um, which is very interesting that not only would Bond work with a, such a criminal, he would marry his daughter and actually never actually try to take out Draco, never try to take him down or anything like that, um, despite how much illegal activity he was a part of. And then in the films in this period, we see a major shift in uh, the actors. We go from Connery to Lazenby to Moore, um, and the shifting image of Bond um, made him more of a character, less of a real person. It sort of brought him back a notch. Um, it, he was almost no longer a person in the way that he used to be because it was like Connery was Bond and Bond was Connery, but then suddenly we have Lazenby and Moore appear. Um, so again, yeah, it sort of made him this timeless, ageless character. Um, and with the appearance of George Lazenby, he only appeared in a single film. Um, he's definitely one of the more forgettable Bond actors. Uh, he was not as macho as Connery. People were uncomfortable with the change uh, because they were so used to Connery. Uh, he had very like extravagant like fight scenes in the movies and stuff, but he was definitely not by any means the same. Um, and then after Lazenby's single appearance, uh, we have Roger Moore. Um, and he appears in Live and Let Die, he's much more sophisticated and he relies more on like cunning than um, actual like brute force. Um, definitely again, the same thing as Lazenby where he wasn't as like manly as Connery, but um, he still was like fun, you know? Um, so like he was cunning in the way that like there was a fight scene in Live and Let Die uh, where instead of Bond just straight up taking out uh, the the robber um, he ends up actually tricking him to fall into like a pool filled with sharks and that's how the robber ends up dying rather than some of the fight scenes we saw in like George Lazenby and on Her Majesty's Secret Service right. and so that was the end of the transitional Bond period and we see how Bond has continued to develop um, today and since 1987 um, so there are plenty more books and more films in this period um, The Living Daylights was published uh, and 007 New York. They were published posthumously um, because Fleming died in 1964, but these books, these short stories, uh, were published in 1966. And what they did is they sort of shifted away the idea of Bond only appearing in novels to more bite-sized pieces, um, like short stories, these like small, like 30-page um, little books. Uh, and so it made Bond more, I guess, in a way, like, Fun size, you know, like he was more, uh, it was easier for someone to read a 30 page book than like a 300 page novel. 
Um, and then in the Living Daylights film, the producers were met with an entirely new problem. Um, it's much easier to make a film based off, again, like a 300 page novel than a 30 page short story. Um, so what they ended up doing is they had the Bond, the book, The Living Daylights, um, was the very first part of the film. It was just a few minutes long and um, basically the other two hours of the movie was uh, made up. It was made up by um, just the writers of the film. Um, and then you see Goldeneye, uh, which modernizes the film a lot. It starts moving away from the Cold War uh, and Spectre today um, with like the amazingly high production values, uh, which truly, truly has glamorized and idolized Bond um, in this airbrushed figure. And of course, in this new period, we see plenty of new gadgets, um, like the ballpoint pen with crossword nade and uh, the door decoder and Goldeneye. Uh, the pen, like you click it three times and it arms the pen, you click it three times and it disarms the pen um, into a bob. And then the door decoder, where you just put the machine onto the door, it tells you what the keypad code was to the door, and then it unlocks it. Um, and then the aircraft snowmobile, which essentially is an airplane without the wings that traverses the snow. Um, and the Omega Seamaster exploding watch, which was able to arm a bomb that set off to a minute timer. Um, and the miniature binoculars and rifles with shields and the uh, And again, these new gadgets, of course, um, like no one in the world is gonna, like no average citizen is gonna have a ballpoint pen with a class four grenade, you know? Um, so these, again, separated Bond from the average consumer. Um, these things that he could have that no one else could. Um, and sort of, again, like this super hero of a person. Um, and then finally we see the Bond franchise moving away from the Cold War. Cause for so long, Fleming, he wrote the books from 1953 to his death um, and so he only wrote the books during like the thick of the Cold War when everything was going on when Korea was going on um, the Cuban Missile Crisis um, and so that definitely set a background for most of the novels and most of the books um, and in the films that were published later after his death like Goldeneye for example uh, we see that they're finally moving away they're modernizing um, like in Goldeneye the Cold War is shown as uh, they're at the end of the Cold War at the very beginning of the movie, and it sort of sets the background for the movie in a lot of ways, but it by no means dominates it in the way that a lot of the other ones did. Uh, <clears throat> and then uh, we, there are still some influences you see, uh, like Valentin Zukovsky, um, who's a former KGB agent, um, and he works with him to set up a meeting to try and meet Janice, the enemy figure in GoldenEye. Um, and then you see Spectre basically entirely abandoning um, Cold War themes and much more towards like this new like uh, Spectre global terrorist organization, uh, which is much more relevant to today, of course. Uh, so yeah, uh, that is all. Thank you so much. The Bond of the Pop Podcast.